Welcome everyone uh, to the first part of this year's ASC uh, Healthcare Value Summit. Uh, in this hour, we're going to discuss uh, some of the activity that's going on on Capitol Hill and obviously uh, lots of changes uh, since the election, uh, a lot of different focus on healthcare issues at the federal government level. And uh, many of these affect all of us in the ASC. And so to uh, educate us, we've invited uh, our DC lobbyists uh, to, and, and legal team to, to join us, uh, Lauren Aronson and Dean Rosen. Uh, so I'm gonna introduce them and then I'm gonna let them give their presentations. And then we're gonna uh, have a sort of a fireside chat uh, at the end of the session and maybe uh, try to expand on some of the topics that they, that they talk about. Uh, during the presentation, I wanna encourage you all to submit your questions. Uh, I'm sure we're not going to get a chance to answer all of the questions live, but we will make an effort to um, to address uh, your questions. Uh, <clears throat> that, that the ones that we don't get to, we'll we'll address them and post them on on the advocacy website. So <clears throat> let me introduce Lauren Aronson. Uh, she's a partner at uh, Melman, Castanetti, Rosen, and Thomas. Uh, she's held a lot of positions both in the executive branch of the government and the legislative branch of the government. Uh, probably the one uh, that's worth highlighting is that she was the policy director uh, in the Office of Health Reform in the Obama administration. And so she uh, was heavily involved in the development of the Affordable Care Act. And uh, as you'll see, she's uh, very passionate uh, on this and, and, and all health policy issues. Our second speaker is Dean Rosen, who's also a partner at Melman, Castanetti, Rosen, and Thomas. The difference is that he's got his name on the letterhead. Um, his area of expertise is also healthcare policy. Uh, after he received his law degree, he uh, served in a variety of different positions, both in the private sector and in the government. Uh, among the government positions that he's served in, he was the chief uh, healthcare advisor for Bill Frist when uh, Dr. Frist was the uh, Senate Majority Leader. Uh, he's, uh, Dean has also uh, served in positions in the House Ways and Means Committee and in the Senate Help Committee. That's the uh, Health Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. Uh, he was uh, instrumental in uh, a variety of laws, including HIPAA that we're all familiar with, uh, the Balanced Budget Act of 1997, and the Medicare Prescription Benefit Act. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren and Dean, and they'll give us a, 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 a sense of what's going on on Capitol Hill. Hi, I'm Lauren Aronson, a partner at Melman Castagnetti, and I'm here with my Republican partner, Dean Rosen. We are very excited to be with you here this afternoon to be talking about what's going on in Washington. We have long enjoyed our relationship with ASC, and we are excited to be with you here virtually. We hope next year to see you in person, but for now, we're going to walk you through what's happening in Washington. Dean, take it away. <laughs> thanks, Lauren, and thanks again to everybody at ASC for the opportunity to work together and help represent your interest in Washington, D.C. Um, today, we're gonna to talk about sort of three main things to try to set the context for um, what's happening uh, at the federal level from a policy standpoint. And then uh, at the conclusion, we're gonna do a Q&A session with Dr. Picard, which we're very much looking forward to and getting into some deeper questions. So first, we're gonna talk about a really significant law that was passed, um, almost $2 trillion in COVID relief signed into law by President Biden in, in March. That comes on top of $4 trillion in, in multiple bills that was passed, uh, that were passed last year um, by Congress uh, and, and signed by President Trump. So significant investments here. Second, um, Lauren is then gonna talk about sort of the upcoming agenda, not just what happened, but what is gonna happen, including uh, the infrastructure plan that the Biden administration has put forward, um, economic reforms, healthcare reforms, and other things that we can expect, and then some of the um, priorities in Congress that may or may not lead to uh, bipartisan compromise beyond uh, infrastructure and the Biden initiatives and what President Biden can do uh, on his own. Uh, so first, uh, we're going to talk about these three pieces, and there really are three sort of pillars to the Biden um, uh, plan so far. There's a lot of little things that we'll talk about, but the, but the president's basically structured um, his first year around three main large buckets of reform. The first, this law that passed, as I said, 
uh, 1.9 trillion. And then he's proposed in March and April two additional significant federal investments. One, a jobs and infrastructure plan that would amount to 2.3 trillion, and the other about a $1.8 trillion uh, family plan that provides, as I, I noted earlier, kind of economic support. So let's talk about the rescue plan briefly. Um, this is what has already become law back in March, it was initially proposed um, right when uh, President Biden and the administration took office, um, passed the House and then the Senate. Um, there, there were a number of initial things that were included that, that didn't make it in, but for the most part, um, basically what President Biden proposed, the Democratic Congress passed with zero Republican votes. Um, and that was really just a function of the fact that Republicans felt this was too much, this was too big, uh, on top of about a trillion dollar bill that they had just passed in December. Um, and, and there were some things that were uh, not just a, a, a big price tag, but some things that were that were controversial. Um, but let's just talk about the highlights of what was in it beyond the big $1.9 trillion price tag that sort of relates to the healthcare sector. So there were about $15 billion for vaccine distribution. This was um, right uh, at around the time that the first uh, emergency use authorizations were, were starting to be approved for the three vaccines. There were $50 billion to expand testing and tracing uh, for COVID. There was uh, over $130 billion to schools for safety equipment and upgrades. There were uh, a big piece of this beyond support for healthcare systems and, school and schools was direct assistance in the form of $1,400 stimulus checks up to individuals earning less than $75,000 a year. Um, you may ask why $1,400? Um, in the December bill, there was a bipartisan agreement to provide $600, and a number of, of Democrats uh, campaigned on the fact that there should be $2,000 checks, so they effectively rounded it up. Um, there was a, an additional, um, since the start of the pandemic back in March of last year, the federal government has supplemented state unemployment benefits. Um, there was an extension to that. Initially, it was $600 a week of federal money that, that dropped that to $300 a week. There were increases in the child tax credit, the earned income tax credit. There was additional uh, funding uh, for, um, for uh, states through uh, what they call the FMAP, the federal matching rate for Medicaid, um, specifically um, going to two categories. And this will be a theme throughout what I think the Democrats in Congress want to do going forward, as Lauren will talk about, but um, support for home and community-based care. So again, a, a bump up in federal matching dollars for home and community-based care. And a bump up in matching dollars is kind of an enticement to get non-expansion states, those kind of red states that have not expanded Medicaid, uh, a bit of a carrot to do so. Uh, none have so far, I think, taken them up on it, but that money still is available. And then in addition to some of the individual relief and the healthcare relief, there were um, some targeted um, uh, funds that were made available for um, small business, the so-called PPP fund, and certain hard-hit industries like airlines and restaurants and others in hospitality to help get them through the pandemic. Uh, just to note, initially in this bill, um, the uh, the big thing that didn't make it was that the Democrats had proposed a, an increase in $15 a minimum wage, and that was found that under the special budget reconciliation rules, the fast track rules that they used, that that couldn't make it through because of what they call the bird rule, um, just requires everything in a reconciliation bill to primarily be about the budget. So that, that sort of major initiative fell off, and we may see that circulate back in again. Um, the next two slides, and we, I should say we'll make our slides available to anyone who participates here um, through the good folks at ASE. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail, but just to show you quickly um, a little bit more detail on some of the, the vaccine and testing provisions, I, you know, the, how that breaks down, uh, the, you know, some amount of money went to CDC, some went to um, BARDA to help with supplies. Uh, the, the bulk of it um, went to testing and, and frontline workers. Uh, there were some that went to future uh, work around genome sequencing for, for upcoming variants. There was also targeted community support for veterans, for Indian Health Service, and for communities of color and underserved populations. 
Um, and then finally, there were, you know, again, to drill down a little bit on the healthcare provisions, um, there were some insurance provisions. And I, I just want to flag here that that these are going to become important going forward, um, because as the as Lauren will talk about here in a moment, as the Democrats look to what do they do about infrastructure, and they've defined infrastructure very broadly to be not just roads and tunnels and bridges, but human infrastructure. There's a lot of debate about what they may do to support people with their health care, and um, and some of the temporary. Uh, provisions that were put in place around health insurance coverage under the American Rescue Plan um, are uh, prime candidates to be extended. So uh, this is an important slide in that sense. So um, number one, uh, a lot of criticism of the Trump administration that they basically didn't care about the Affordable Care Act and they, they defunded or they didn't do anything in terms of community outreach. So this bill put in $50 million for, for outreach. They also extended um, what they call a special enrollment period under the Affordable Care Act so that people who weren't covered could get in. Um, and uh, basically, um, the biggest thing was um, providing additional support for individuals um, who um, basically were above 400% of poverty um, it, right now under the, the uh, ACA, um, the, the, the subsidies cut off at 400 uh, percent of poverty. They were extended and then phased out, I think, up to 600 percent of poverty. And then they also provided um, uh, more low-income subsidies to fill in some of the cost-sharing gaps for lower-income Americans um, so that, uh, you know, no one who's covered would pay more than 8.5 percent of their household income uh, on coverage. Um, so that was significant. And then there were also sub Do you subsidies for, for one second on that point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think what's when you're thinking about from a contextual perspective, the um, investments that Congress made in the Affordable Care Act um, via the American Rescue Plan was probably the most substantial investment and in changes we've seen um, to the ACA since its passage in 2010. So as everyone knows, it's obviously been a very um, a very partisan discussion around health care, particularly and the ACA over the last you know, 10, 11 years. Um, so I just want to point out that this piece is probably the most significant change we've seen since the since the law. Um, took effect in 2010. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And then there was some additional support, um, not only for individuals, but also for hospitals and providers on, um, uh, you know, 8.5 billion additional dollars for the provider relief fund that went to rural communities and some other support for ambulances and other things. So it was a significant law. That's a little bit of the breakdown. Um, I'm going to kind of conclude my part here and then turn it over to Lauren by just uh, and, and both of us can talk a little bit about this by sort of saying, okay, that's what passed uh, already in the rescue plan. Uh, we're going to talk in a moment about the next two big bills the Democrats hope to pass on the what's so-called the jobs plan and the families plan. But when you step back and you look at for contextually, what's the big picture on the Biden healthcare agenda right now? Um, we sort of put it into these six buckets. Um, and uh, I'll uh, try to tick through them and Lauren uh, chime in on, on anything here, but I, I'd say first um, on COVID, um, you know, as we've seen that there was a lot of criticism about the Trump administration sending mixed messages, devaluing uh, science and certainly the, the expert agencies, um, a lot of the uh, Republican mantra about fire Fauci. Um, so, you know, I would say you'd sum up the, the Biden administration approach with Hire Fauci, don't fire Fauci, more robust, coordinated effort <clears throat> at the federal level, uh, more um, work on supply chain issues and public health emergency authorities, which have been relied upon for everything from telehealth flexibility to um, EUA approvals for vaccines and testing will be extended at least through the end of this year. Um, so that's, you know, that's number one um, on on. Uh, on the Affordable Care Act, I'll just go left to right here and um, I'll, I'll go through the Affordable Care Act and Medicare and more, and you should talk about Medicaid, prescription drugs and telehealth. But on the ACA, um, again, kind of a reversal of the Trump administration's policies, um, more generous special enrollment periods. We've already seen that, number one. Um, a feeling that the you heard a lot of Democratic rhetoric in the campaign uh, in 2020 about um, <clears throat> about the Trump administration, Republicans undermining the Affordable Care Act, even though they never passed a law to repeal it. So how did they 
do that. Democrats believe that allowing people to enroll in these short-term limited duration plans that lacked full um, non-discrimination protections were really a way of undermining the law. So there was a, a reversal of the Trump uh, policies on short-term limited duration plans and association health plans. They'll look to roll those back. They're gonna resume very aggressive enrollment outreach. Uh, they already, as I said, provided some $50 million additional funding in the rescue plan. Um, it, it, they also, as I said, enhanced the premium tax credits and they've reinstated already some of the Obama era non-discrimination protections against uh, transgender individuals and others. So we're gonna go from an era where you had a Republican administration that sort of let the ACA wither uh, even if they didn't undermine it, they certainly let it wither um, to uh, an administration that's going to do everything they can to to make sure that people have affordable um, coverage. And then on on I'll do Medicare, and then Lauren can do the last three here. But I think on Medicare, um, you know, I think there was a lot of unanimity among Republicans and Democrats, and I know this sort of affects us a lot, but. Um, I think there'll be a continued push toward more value-based care. Um, you saw that start under the Obama <clears throat> um, uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. You saw it continue under the Trump administration with a lot of uh, mandatory bundles and other things around, uh, around certain procedures. Um, you're going to, I think, continue to see that now. Um, th there also, I think, will be a greater focus in this administration, not only on value, but also on health equity. Um, and you've already seen a commission uh, and advisory that's been set up. You have Susan Rice, who's running the Domestic Policy Council, who's got a huge focus on health equity. And I think you'll see that flow through every policy. So you may hear value and you may hear equity um, basically be parallels. Um, <clears throat> there'll be a greater push for transparency, just like the Trump administration. I think a lot of belief that providers, hospitals, health plans, everyone should be more transparent about their rates um, and about their quality. Um, there'll be a little bit of <clears throat> headwinds on Medicare Advantage reimbursement and a regulatory climate that's probably not as favorable to private Medicare plans as the Trump administration. I think we'll start to see more scrutiny around fee-for-service providers, and this will be something that ASC and others have to watch out for as we've got codes where there's, there's heavy utilization and a lot of use. I think we'll see um, uh, you know, some look around that. I think the administration's still debating more on what they're going to do about Stark and anti-kickback flexibility in Medicare um, at this point, right? Yeah, I don't really expect the Democrats will pursue a lot of the same changes that Republicans did on Stark um, and anti-kickback. I think that there's, you know, there's definitely a policy disagreement about whether or not those flexibilities are really needed, if they're value add. Um, and I think just, you know, broadly the way I think this administration is going to approach Medicare policy is um, from the mindset and, and point of view of a Medicare beneficiary. I mean, I just think it's going to be a very, I, although I agree with everything you laid out, Dean, I do think that the way they're going to review all these Medicare policies is going to be through the eyes of, of the beneficiary itself. So I do think that's going to change how they approach Medicare policy broadly. Um, I also want to underscore a little bit that as we're thinking about who the new players are, which we'll talk in more depth with Dr. Picard later this afternoon, but you know, Javier Becerra, who's now Secretary of Health and Human Services, you know, represented when he was a member of Congress on the Ways and Means Committee, he represented the six poorest districts in the country where over 200 languages were spoken. So issues around health equity and health access are things that he's been working on for his entire career. Um, and so just to underscore Dean's point, you know, the topics on health equity are going to play out in every you know, initiative we see from the administration. We will see probably big policy initiatives, but we're also gonna see um, you know, smaller things where they're requesting stakeholder feedback. So just thinking about the IPPS rule that came out, you know, there was a request for information on, on health equity. And so I think we're gonna see that play out in all of the you know, major rules and regulations that come out from the administration. Um, I think the other thing to note from a Medicare perspective as well though, is that as we're thinking particularly about CMMI, um, and some of the demos that the previous administration put forward, you know, we're already seeing a scaling back of some of those. Um, just to give you an example of the next gen ACO model has been scaled back. Um, you know, folks who were enrolling in that have now been or can move over to direct contracting. Um, we've already seen a cap on how many um, entities can participate in direct contracting model. So, you know, I think we're going to see a situation where agree with Dean that we're definitely still continuing to talk about value, but instead of having, you know, a thousand flowers 
bloom from a CMI perspective, I think we're going to see much more of um, a return to some of the core desires of what the ACA tried to intend with CMI. So thinking about, you know, continuing to invest in ACOs, which I think were plays from a backstop and not really a ton of interest on the Republican side during the Trump administration. So we're going to see, I think, a, a a more core return to some significant demos rather than seeing sort of a, a thousand flowers bloom. Yeah. And Lauren, why don't you talk about Medicaid prescription drugs and telehealth real quickly from the administration standpoint, and then um, we'll go to the uh, sort of the next big tranche here of once we set the stage of the, um, the families and the jobs plan. Absolutely. Um, so I think from a Medicaid perspective, as Dean noted, you know, the American Rescue Plan did include significant uh, additional incentives for states to expand Medicaid. Um, I think trying to get those last 15 states that haven't moved on Medicaid expansion to expand is something that's critically important to Democrats. Um, particularly for this administration, I think Medicaid has probably been a program most under assault from the Trump administration. Um, and so there's a lot of things that won't be considered quite as sexy from a health policy perspective, but are really critically important to maintain maintaining access for Medicaid beneficiaries. So things like streamlining enrollment, uh, reversing the public charge rule, um, you know, rolling back some of the work requirements that were provided in some of the state waivers, um, you know, more flexibility for states um, and MCOs to address social determinants of health. You know, we're going to see a lot more investment in more of the day-to-day -day maintenance of the Medicaid program to ensure there aren't any barriers in place for individuals to have access to the program itself, um, and also continue to see further incentives for states to expand Medicaid. On the prescription drug front, obviously drug pricing remains a very critical issue for Democrats, both in Congress and the administration. Um, I think we will see um, some of the Trump rules stay in place, maybe drug importation and others where that's historically been a bipartisan conversation. Um, but as it relates to other, you know, more controversial Medicare drug policies, I think drug pricing is something that the administration feels strongly about. The president spoke about it in his, um, in his uh, speech to Congress several weeks ago. And obviously it remains a key priority for Speaker Pelosi. So I definitely believe we'll see a lot of action on drug pricing. My general sense is we'll see probably more action on the legislative front rather than the regulatory front in the short term, because I think the administration wants to give Congress all the tools in the toolbox to really try to approach this issue in a multifaceted way before they sort of step in and do things from a regulatory perspective. Uh, but no doubt drug pricing will be a very big issue this year. In addition, you know, telehealth and digital health are really things that are very bipartisan. Um, definitely have a lot of conversation happening on Capitol Hill, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, to extend some of the flexibilities that have been provided uh, through COVID and several waivers that have been provided through the previous administration as well as Congress. Um, I do think telehealth is probably one of the um, shining lights of, of the COVID pandemic, where it really has accelerated the policy conversation around telehealth and its value several years. Um, there's still some significant headwinds relative to the budget um, and scoring from the Congressional Budget Office, um, but generally I expect there to, I expect to see um, additional flexibilities provided and a continuation of flexibilities that have currently been put in place. So just as we're thinking about how much we've spent, and I know obviously Republicans like to talk about this more, uh, more than Democrats, but obviously, you know, we're at a moment um, where it's really significant and thinking about where we're going. Um, you know, the president's plan in terms of American jobs really just focusing on issues around transportation, uh, whether it be more traditional infrastructures, we call it roads and bridges, public transit. Um, you know, airports, et cetera, but then also things like affordable housing and clean energy and broadband. Um, these are things maybe that Republicans will consider uh, infrastructure um, or jobs, but they really are something that are critically important to how Democrats are viewing this. Childcare in particular is a critical issue as well, um, as is community colleges and education. Um, and then generally, you know, we're also seeing a significant investment in domestic manufacturing, National Science Foundation. Um, right now, the Senate is debating a bipartisan bill um, called the Innovation and Jobs Act, uh, which would basically try to lessen our, um, our reliance on China from a scientific perspective. This is something that's a, a key priority for Senator Schumer, and he's been working for months on a bipartisan basis with Republican Senator Todd Young. Um, we're at a pivotal moment in the Senate right now to see if that bill can get off the Senate floor uh, this week before Memorial Day recess. Um, but there's no question that it's something that remains, um, I think, a key priority for this administration as well as congressional Democrats. And I just want to note one thing here. You can sort of see in this visual, um, you know, some of the partisan breakdown over why this is such a difficult um, 
endeavor. Um, you know, there's a lot of bipartisan support. You saw Donald Trump was very supportive, although they never moved on anything during the um, last Congress on infrastructure. But you look at so, some of the things in the in the first two columns, um, not everything in the first two columns, but a lot of it, electric vehicles, roads and bridges, public transportation, broadband, um, water systems, lead pipe elimination, road safety, et cetera, waterways and ports. Those are things I think that that people in Washington think about as traditional infrastructure. And those are things that Republicans have kind of put forward in an alternative bill, several alternative bills uh, to fund. The amount of those is more like six to eight hundred billion dollars where there's <clears throat> disagreement is, you know, Republicans sort of charge that the administration is greatly expanding what it means to pass an infrastructure bill. Um, you know, things like childcare facilities, okay, they're infrastructure, but not traditional um, kind of roads and bridges, uh, public schools. Um, but then you get into, um, you know, community college support, um, research, um, uh, uh, clean en energy manufacturing, um, you know, those kinds of things that go a little bit climate technology. And, and you'll see in the next bill too, um, so it's just to sort of point out that if, if there's a bipartisan agreement on infrastructure, um, one of the big things that they'll have to sort of kind of square the circle on is how you define infrastructure. Um, and, and, and that's one of the big questions is, is it sort of just roads and bridges and, and things like that? Or is it infrastructure beyond that? Or is it, as the president wants to define it, even broader on human infrastructure? I'll go to the next slide here. Um, specific health care provisions in the jobs plan. So uh, to, to our Dean's earlier point, obviously health care remains, I think, a critical, yeah, thank you, uh, mm -hmm. remains a critical priority for, for President Biden. And so, you know, in the jobs plan that he offered, um, you know, most significantly, I think, in the, in the original plan was a $400 billion investment in home and community-based um, services. So I think that is something that, you know, Congress is very excited about. I think folks in the disability community and the home community are very excited about. So right now there's an effort underway in Congress and the Democratic side of the aisle to figure out, you know, with $400 billion potentially um, invested here, which is really just a significant amount for this program, you know, what is the best way to go about it? And so I think that there's a conversation happening about expanding access to long-term care services for Medicaid beneficiaries. Um, you know, there's a conversation around extending Sending the money follows the program person. Um, there's also a robust conversation about how do you increase wages um, for home health care workers. So there's really the core home and community-based um, services conversation, but there's also a conversation happening separately of that, which you know I'll call home and community-based adjacent policies, which are things that like tax credits for caregivers. And so I think that there's definitely a robust recognition um, that the, you know we have to really double down in terms of our efforts around home care, but then also think about how do we support families beyond that as well. Um, you know, in addition, the president did put forward um, a significant investments and pandemic um, preparedness, you know, relating to optimizing the R&D process, you know, strengthening our U.S. national stock, uh, stockpile. That was something we, we saw really face many challenges to the pandemic. So figuring out ways to do that is, is important. Um, investing in biosecurity is, is a critical issue as well. Um, and certainly the president has put forward an executive order similar to the one that President Trump did as well about how do we onshore um, you know, domestic manufacturing, um, incentivized domestic manufacturing for things like medical devices, um, things like pharmaceuticals, things that we will need in the next pandemic so that we're not relying on China, but that we're also just, we have, um, we have the stockpile that we need in place here. Um, you know, there's lots of other conversations that are happening. Um, the president didn't necessarily delineate specific policies um, on other potential provisions at the bottom of the slide, but he did talk about them broadly. Um, obviously, the president talked about Medicare direct negotiation and drug pricing in his speech to Congress. Um, that is something that is a key uh, policy priority for Speaker Pelosi um, and congressional Democrats. Um, so I do think we're going to have, as I noted earlier, a robust conversation and legislative effort around drug pricing. Um, some of these other areas are a little bit, uh, and I'd say in a different category, you know, lowering the age of Medicare eligibility is something that's been discussed broadly among Democrats for a long time. Um, I think expanding Medicare benefits to include, you know, dental, vision, um, and hearing is something Democrats would like to pursue. Uh, we're seeing more of that push from the left wing of the party, um, Senator Sanders and others. 
I will note that investing in those services are, are incredibly expensive, um, particularly the dental benefit, although it's, of course, very well needed for Medicare beneficiaries. Um, I could see a scenario where uh, hearing and vision get included ultimately in a bill, but I think dental is unlikely given the price tag. Uh, restructuring Medicare Part D is something there's been wide bipartisan conversations about both in the House and Senate going back several years now. Um, so I do expect if there's a drug pricing uh, policy that comes together, I think a restructuring of Medicare Part D is likely to be included as well. Um, and then, you know, I think there are a lot of policies that are being discussed to kind of uh, hold manufacturers accountable for any sort of price gouging. Um, and so I think that we're going to see robust interest, particularly in the Democratic side of the aisle on those policies as well. Should I go to the next slide? Please. Okay. So as we're thinking now about the American Families Plan, I know it's hard to keep up. We have the American Rescue Plan, the American Jobs Plan, and we have the American Families Plan. So focusing on, you know, the way the president is thinking about the American Families Plan, um, there are a lot of things that I would say the president would like to pursue. So we had, you know, the infrastructure policies, but then we also have the more social infrastructure elements. So things like education, investing $200 billion in universal pre-K, childcare, paid leave. Um, these are things I think are critical to how the president and the administration are thinking about how we can ensure that we're supporting, you know, all of the families that have been struggling through this pandemic. Um, and then finally, there are a variety of tax credits, whether it be the earned income tax credit um, or other tax credits, I think the president would like to make permanent, but also separately, I think the way that the president would like to pay for many of these issues is by um, going back and taking a look at the Trump 27 tax law and rolling back some of those um, tax credits that were provided to corporate America, and also potentially raising taxes on individuals making above $400,000. And that's another, um, and that's another issue I pointed out earlier, the, the part of the reason it's been difficult to get together on a bipartisan basis is Republicans view the definition of infrastructure a lot more narrowly, and obviously, childcare, education, paid leave uh, is, is broad. The other thing that the Republican leadership in Congress has made clear is the red line that they will not cross is any tax increase that rolls back the Trump tax cuts. So if there is gonna be a bipartisan infrastructure package, and it wouldn't be all this, the Democrats are still gonna move forward. I think Lauren and I agree on a budget reconciliation process that will, that will have to pass a lot, if not most of this stuff. But if they're gonna move forward um, on a bipartisan piece of it, on traditional infrastructure, that's gonna to have to be funded by, by fees, by cutting in other areas, um, by increases in things like the gas tax and other things, it will not be funded with tax increases. That's another bright line that you'll hear play out throughout the summer. Great, let's go to the next slide. So as we're thinking about, you know, the additional health provisions that the president would like to see, I think, made permanent. So obviously, you know, we have the ACA premium tax credits um, and all of the health policies that Dean uh, walked through from the American Rescue Plan. Those are all time limited. So making those investments in the subsidy reduction and cost sharing reductions permanent um, is a critical priority. And I'd say the highest priority in terms of health policy for the president and Congress moving forward. Um, but in addition, paid leave, I'd say, is a strong number two. Um, there's, an, a, you know, a really strong design desire to focus on paid leave and really accelerate where um, our country is in terms of paid leave. And then in addition, there's a lot of focus also on nutrition. Um, this is a key priority for the administration as well, given how challenging things were for American families through the pandemic. Um, so figuring out ways to make some of these programs permanent um, and continuing to help um, move forward on, on food deserts, et cetera, I think is, is, a, is a key priority. And I'll, I mean, I'll just talk at a high level about the Democratic congressional agenda, because I know we're going to get into a lot of this Q&A with Dr. Picard shortly. But obviously, infrastructure, given everything the president has laid out, is, is a key priority, obviously, for Democrats. Um, so we're going to see a lot of that start to play out over the next couple of months in Congress. Voting rights continues to be also a key priority. Um, you know, that is something that has passed the House, it's not yet passed the Senate. Um, but given all the assault we're seeing on voting rights across the country at the state level, this is something that's critically important to Democrats. Um, civil rights, you know, yesterday marked the year anniversary death of, of George Floyd. And so obviously we saw a significant conversation around civil rights um, and justice reform and police reform. Um, you know, I think that is something that is really critical to Democrats moving forward. And we will continue to see a robust uh, conversation about that.
Um, gun safety also continues to remain a key priority for congressional Democrats. We did have background checks and other uh, gun safety bills passed the House floor. Um, they've not yet been taken up in the Senate, but again, that is a, a key a key uh, priority for Democrats. And then finally, as Dean noted, obviously continuing to roll back some of the policies from the previous administration is something that we're going to see across the board hitting every agency. You know, just one one note here, Lauren, before we go to the last slide, um, just to point out, and we probably should have mentioned this contextually uh, earlier, but, you know, one of the things I think to keep in mind here on all of this is, you know, that there are a couple things here that could um, find bipartisan support. And why do we keep coming back to that? Um, I guess, number one, it's good for the country if uh, parties can get together, but also it's, it's critical to passage. The, the Senate right now is, I think, the fourth time in history ever in the history of the country that we've had an equally divided Senate, 50-50. There's a power sharing agreement. The Democrats have the majority because Vice President Harris would break any tie theoretically. So the Democrats are technically in the majority, but it's a 50-50 split. And the Democrats in the House have a, a four or five, six seat majority. That's the lowest it's been since the, the mid 1800s. It's actually so, a three seat now. <laughs> three seats now couple, with retirement. A couple of open seats, yes. So, you know, you, you think about that and every Democratic vote counts. So why is that important? First of all, um, we talked about the fact that the American Rescue Plan went through budget reconciliation, which requires a majority in the Senate. Um, and that's what happened. We talked about the fact that, that it's probably likely that some of these, these very aggressive, ambitious Biden administration Democratic plans that Lauren just outlined on infrastructure writ large um, is going to have to pass on budget reconciliation. Well, that's going to require every Democrat in the Senate to vote for it and almost every Democrat in the House to vote for it. Those are very, very thin margins. Some of these other things, voting rights, um, gun safety, police reform, um, those things under the budget rules can't pass under fast track. They need 60 votes. So a lot of this will not happen. A lot of this has passed and will pass the House, but it's going to, um, if it passes the Senate at all, there'll be very, very narrow um, compromises. A gun safety would be an example where there may be, um, you know, greater focus on registration, uh, background checks, um, you know, gun sale loophole closings and things like that, but it won't be the full gun safety measure of banning assault weapons or anything like that. Because they just do not have the votes to do it. Frankly, even if they had four or five more Democrats in the Senate, given the fact that there's some, some Democrats from red states or more moderate Democrats uh, like Joe Manchin from West Virginia, they wouldn't be able to pass it anyway. So that, that context is really important. And then I think we'll just kind of conclude here. We, we've talked through a lot of these issues previously, um, some of this will play out in the context of the um, American Jobs Plan or the American uh, Families Plan or whatever the Biden administration decides to do in conjunction with the leadership, the Democratic leadership in the in the House and the Senate. Um, but there will be some other things that move along too. So we mentioned that just in the summary slide, um, what is Congress going to do? Well, they're going to have to process all the things that the president proposes if they're going to if they're going to pass and he can't do everything on his own through regulation or executive order. So we talked about the fact that part of the big goal here on the healthcare stuff is for the Democrats to expand beyond 2023 those ACA subsidies. We talked. Lauren talked about the fact that there's a robust discussion around Medicare improvement and expansion. Um, seems to be a little bit more emphasis now on improving the Medicare benefits, dental, vision, hearing, and lowering out of pocket as opposed to lowering the Medicare eligibility age. But that will be a debate that will play out over the course of the infrastructure plan. Uh, drug pricing is the other one. Um, Democrats last Congress passed uh, HR3, which included about $500 billion in savings. But that bill, um, which included um, um, pretty controversial provisions for some that would allow the government to negotiate drug prices that would basically set prices and cap prices. Uh, a lot of the of those reforms are bipartisan, but a lot of those reforms are going to are not going to pass the Senate for the reasons we talked about earlier. You've got Democratic senators from places like New Jersey, where there's a huge manufacturing base for the pharmaceutical industry and some of those more robust 
changes won't go through. So a question of, you know, whether they can achieve some of those savings, they'll need some because the president has said that the spending uh, in the infrastructure plan has to be offset by uh, either tax increases or drug price savings or other things, other cutbacks. So, but that will be debated. Um, and then the last two I mentioned quickly, and, and Lauren will uh, fill in the blanks and tell me what I got wrong here, but um, uh, maternal and child health and, and health IT. Maternal and child health is actually an area where there's been a fair amount of bipartisan work. Um, there's a, a Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act, which is a comprehensive bill um, aimed mainly at minority communities, but, but others as well that has some bipartisan support. Um, then there's a number of other um, less comprehensive bipartisan bills that are, are moving through Congress that provide Medicaid coverage, funding, research, quality improvement, uh, labor protections um, for nursing mothers and other things, um, and support in rural areas. Um, and, and I think we will see uh, some of those provisions pass on a bipartisan basis outside of this very sort of partisan discussion around reconciliation. And then health IT, as Lauren mentioned before, when we talked about the administration, is also another area of bipartisan support in Congress. The, um, I think as, as a lot of folks know here, um, the, uh, the public health emergency waiver that was put into place um, earlier this year and that the Biden administration has signaled that it's going to extend through at least this calendar year provided a lot of flexibility um, for providers to see patients um, through telehealth uh, that waived a lot of things that I, I think were pretty antiquated, like Medicare um, uh, site restrictions and geographic limitations where you actually couldn't use a smartphone to talk to your doctor if you needed a consultation, but you had to go to a physical facility or you had to be located in a particularly rural area of the country. Um, if, if you saw a patient and you consulted uh, via video, uh, you'd be reimbursed at a lot lower rate. And, and so they provided some parity. Um, there's a lot of interest in, in Congress in making some of those uh, or all of those provisions permanent. The problem is there's also a lot of cost to doing so um, because we're talking about making changes to fee-for-service Medicare. And when you do anything in a fee-for-service kind of unmanaged environment, it almost always costs the Congressional Budget Office views those costs as raising utilization as opposed to substituting for in-person visits completely. So um, the, the, the discussion right now seems to be trending toward maybe extending some of those flexibilities for another year or two, as opposed to making them permanent, but that'll play out over the course of the next um, three to six months as well. So those are some of the big areas, Lauren. I don't know if there's anything we missed or anything you wanna say in terms of a concluding remark before we get into the Q&A. Well, you know, I don't ever like to give you the opportunity to have a closing remark, but I do. I know think that. that. I know that. You, you, <laughs> you have to have you, the last word. <laughs> <laughs> I do think you covered all this really well, and I look forward to our robust conversation with Dr. Picard. Thank you, um, Lauren and Dean. That was really enlightening. And I thought what we'll do for um, the next 20 minutes or so is maybe uh, pursue some of these topics in a little bit more detail. And I would ask you, um, as we're talking about some of these things, um, feel free to really dumb it down and, and explain it in, as I like to say from, my, um, from one of my favorite movies, uh, explain it to me like I was a first grader. I don't know if you guys know that quote from Denzel Washington from the Philadelphia movie, but, but um, let's go into, into, into some of these topics at, a, at a, maybe a, a, a different level than what you would typically talk about them on Capitol Hill. But before we do that, I have to say, that I came away from your discussion a bit pessimistic, um, given that we've got a near 50-50 makeup of the Senate and, and also the Congress, and uh, probably even have some Democrats who are conservative enough that may vote not on the party line, and maybe some Republicans that may vote uh, not on their party line. It sounds to me like it's gonna be very difficult to get many initiatives passed. Uh, through this legislative group. And so what, which, which initiatives in the Biden health plans or, or, or priorities do you see as bipartisan issues that everyone should be able to agree on and that we can look forward to as, as maybe uh, occurring in the next six months or so? 
Well, it's a great question, Dr. Ricard. I'm happy to start. Um, I have a first grader, so I'm happy. <laughs> I'm happy to talk at that level. Um, you know, I'd say a couple things, and you know, I'm disappointed to hear that you were left uh, with some skepticism or pessimism from our presentation. I think a little bit is just, you know, no matter how much bipartisan talk there is in Washington, it's still a very partisan environment, and it's probably more partisan than it's been in the last 20, 25 years. So I think, you know it's very challenging even when members want to have bipartisan conversations and bipartisan consensus, getting something over the finish line that can become law is challenging. Um, I will say there is a bipartisan effort underway right now in the Senate um, to basically try to deal with some issues with China and specifically thinking about how do we invest in innovation back here um, in the U.S. And that revolves around things like um, U.S. domestic manufacturing, um, more um, investments in science and technology. And so that's actually a bipartisan effort that's underway right now in the Senate. It's been a long slog. Um, it's a high priority for Senator Schumer and Senator Todd Young, who is a Republican from Indiana. Um, still unclear whether or not the bill will get off the Senate floor, but there is a bipartisan effort underway to address some of those issues. Um, but those aren't health care issues. They're not, and that's where I was going next. The challenge is that finding, because of, I think, longstanding philosophical disagreements between the parties on issues related to health care. I mean, one of the reasons why I love health policy is because people on all sides of the issue feel so strongly and passionately about their perspective. And health care is certainly, um, you know, a big piece of that. And so I think, especially when you go back to the politics around the Affordable Care Act, it's just become a much more partisan environment on any healthcare policy issue, um, particularly when we're talking about things like coverage and cost containment. I will say, I do think there are areas of bipartisan consensus that can get done on healthcare this year. Um, I think telehealth is one in particular where there is a lot of bipartisan interest um, to expand some of the flexibilities that Congress and the previous administration put forward. I think one of the silver linings from the pandemic really was this acceleration of, of technology um, and the ability for Medicare beneficiaries and patients and providers to interact through telehealth, whether it be through audio only or audio visual. And so that is something where there is a lot of bipartisan interest now. And I do expect we'll see some sort of extension of those telehealth flexibilities get done um, in this Congress this year. So that's not necessarily the most important uh, health policy issue out there, but it is one in particular so, where there's a lot of bipartisan. So let's, let's, let's stick with that for a little bit. What I heard you say what, during the presentation was that it will be extended maybe for a year or, or more, but not enacted into law. Are there things that are, and then this is obviously an issue that's near and dear, I think, to many of our members. Is this something that they should be contacting their local representatives? And if so, what are the points that they should be making? I mean, should we be pushing this to become law or should we allow it to maybe every year get extended? Well, what so you, well, it's, a great, it's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I think the challenge is about whether or not the flexibilities can become permanent or whether or not they'll be extended from in, in a part-time in a sort of a short-term extension, both which become law, but they're not necessarily permanent policy, which is what I think you're alluding to. The challenge is not Democrat or Republican on the permanent policy. The challenge is, I say there are actually several challenges. One is a budget scoring issue as to how expensive it will be. But then two, I think among some of the staff on Capitol Hill, there's some reticence um, to make permanent policy because there isn't enough, in their opinion, there isn't enough data to show what the impact of telehealth has been on healthcare outcomes um, in, in the last few years. And I think that there will have some data shortly on from the pandemic, but I think that they are in a situation where they want to see data outside of a pandemic environment before they make any sort of permanent policy. Um, I'm sure Dean has a thought here and I'll, I'll let him chime in in one second. Um, but to your question as to whether or not, you know, um, our ASC members and others should be talking to the representatives about their experience, I would say absolutely. Um, it's always helpful when members of Congress hear from constituents back home, particularly physicians, um, nurse practitioners, sonographers, others, about what their experiences have been with telehealth and how it's been helpful. Dean, did you want yeah, to I, I just pick up on, yeah, I just pick up on Lauren's last point. I think, I think, first of all, whatever the handicapping is about what might or might not happen this year, I think it's, it's really impactful for these members of Congress to hear from their physicians. I was on a call yesterday with a um, a senior member of the Energy and Commerce Committee who said, you know, this is what I heard from my local physician about the pandemic. And that's a lot more impactful, frankly, than what a lobbyist like Lauren and I might say to them, because 
you know, uh, you're on the ground and you're seeing patients and that's really real. Um, what I would say tactically is that um, I think it's important if we can get some things made permanent this year that makes sense, like some of the remote monitoring that we might do with patients, that may make sense. Some of the mental health um, visits that obviously don't require by definition people, you know, laying their hands on the patient, um, you know, may make sense. Some of the antiquated Medicare rules, um, I, I think a lot of members of Congress are ready to move on for, but as Lauren said, they want to uh, decide what's cost effective and what works post the pandemic. So we may actually be better off, Dr. Picard, by having another year or two to gather data and, and not having Congress come in right now and just with green eye shades make short-term decisions that could cut off a lot of positive uh, visits and opportunities and reimbursement for telehealth, maybe take the things that make sense and make them permanent and take the other things and say, let's give it another couple of years to study it. Okay, that sounds good. And we, you, you mentioned um, health equity during the presentation. And one of the equity issues is that not all people have access to computers and are internet savvy. And so the telephone visit is just as important for many of us as the video remote visit. Is, is CMS making a distinction or do you think they'll make a distinction between the two? Initially, there was a lot of concern that there would be reimbursement for the video, but not the phone visit. And I, I hear different opinions as to what's gonna happen with that. There's, a, there's, a, there's clearly a bias in Washington, I think, among policymakers whether it's Congress or CMS or others, that what we're doing here is better than telephone because you can see the expressions, you can see the person, you can see the issue. Um, but I think as you've said, um, practically, you don't need interactive audio video for every visit from a clinical standpoint. Practically, there are a lot of people uh, in rural America that don't have access to great broadband. Um, there are a lot of people in inner cities uh, and rural America that don't have access to the latest iPhone and they just want to call their doctor and get advice or maybe a high res picture of a dermatology issue or something else is better than video, frankly. So I, I think um, we've, that's one area where I think we've got work to do right now. Um, uh, basically, the rules allow for equity, but what they're trying to do in certain contexts is to not provide the same kind of reimbursement, um, whether it's Medicare Advantage plans or other situations or risk adjustment where it's, it's audio only. And I, I think, frankly, you know, that's a bias we should fight against because the, the, I think the standard of care and clinical effectiveness ought to be the standard, not the modality of delivery. Right. And Maybe I think that's some place where when our members talk with their legislators, that's a, a point I think that they can they can stress. Absolutely. And then going back to your earlier point, Dr. Picard, this is also an area where there's a lot of bipartisan interest. Um, and so it's it's not something that's necessarily like falling down partisan lines. Okay. So um, let's get into the weeds on a, a few topics. Um, Medicare sequester fix. I, I suspect that not all our members even understand what that is. But I know that in March, there was some legislation passed to extend that. Can you explain that in, in, in terms of how that, impact, how that impacts or will impact members of the ASC? Sure, I'm happy to, I'm happy to start. So um, the sequester basically is a budget mechanism that tries to hold down spending across the government and it impacts a variety of programs. Given that Medicare is one of the biggest spenders of taxpayer dollars, um, the sequester does put in place automatic reductions to reimbursements through the Medicare program. So as we're thinking about provider reimbursements, you're looking at a reduction of a, a couple of percentage points. Um, what's happened in the last several years is that there's a broad recognition in Congress that both the sequester cuts that are automatically supposed to take place would really have a detrimental impact on the Medicare program and also on the defense program because they are scheduled to go on the defense side as well. So what's happened several times now is that Congress has stepped in to stop those Medicare cuts from going into place. Um, it most recently happened in March, um, and that's scheduled now to... Um, Apologies, I'm the only person has a home phone left in the United States of America. Um, 
those cuts are also scheduled to now take effect again in September. Um, and so, sorry, at the end of the year, um, end of the calendar year in December. So we expect Congress to um, take up legislation again to push off those cuts again so that that way any Medicare provider is not going to see a, a you know, percentage reduction in their reimbursement. So it's very wonky, but it's, it's, it's a lot of money for providers. So, but in terms of coding and reimbursement, it's, it's pretty much a, a set. It's across, across the board. The board. Okay. It's a so the yeah, this was, What's that, yeah, this was basically a couple years ago when, when there was were bipartisan discussions about deficit reduction, there was a commission and when the commission failed to come to an agreement, the solution was across the board cut. And they've been in effect and they hit Medicare and they hit all providers equally, 2% you know, across the board, X percent across the board. And I think coming out of the pandemic, when so many providers were on the front lines and caring for folks and struggling financially, um, there was a feeling that they should suspend those cuts. And that's really where we are. I think, you know, I, I, um, I would say, I, I think it's something we can't take for granted. Back to your question earlier about what we should be talking to our members of Congress about, because as vaccines become more widely distributed, as the, econo as the economy improves, as the bottom lines of hospitals improve, I, I think there's going to be growing concern again about healthcare cost. And I think that we can't take for granted the fact that they're just gonna keep you know, um, fixing this every couple of months. So I think if we're still under financial duress, it's something we gotta talk to our members of Congress about. Okay, so that's something that you guys will keep us up to date about so that if we need to get our members involved, we can, we can, Absolutely. We can get them mobilized. Um, there's so many things that we could talk about and we've probably only got about five minutes left. Um, I do wanna to get to Lauren's comment uh, to tell us about some of the key players in the new, both in the new administration and just in, in the Capitol building um, that we should be paying attention to. But before we get to that, maybe we'll end with that. But before we get to that, I wanna give you each a minute or so to, to look into your crystal ball for the next six months or so. And from a standpoint of health policy and healthcare issues, what, what do you think you know, will get passed or what will change that uh, we should all know about? So I'm happy to start. Um, Dean will be more pessimistic than I will be. Um, but I think from, from a health policy perspective, obviously President Biden has laid out a lot of health policy initiatives that are very high on his list, which we talked about during our presentation. Um, and I think there are many health policies that are important to Democrats in Congress as well that they, they would like to see get accomplished. So one which we talked about earlier is an extension of the subsidy changes and cost sharing changes that were made in the American Rescue Plan. Um, issues around healthcare affordability, I think are really important across the country. And so, you know, that was the largest investment we've seen in healthcare affordability since the Affordable Care Act. So making those policies permanent, something I think Congress will take up and I could see getting done this year. Um, I also believe that drug pricing is a real issue that obviously the president talked about, Speaker Pelosi cares deeply about, and that's something where there is a lot of conversation as well um, right now. And I, I do think issues around drug pricing will get over the finish line too. So those are my, my two crystal balls. Okay, Dean? Yeah, I think, you know, look, we're back to your earlier question, Dr. Picard. I mean, uh, you know, I think it's, um, it, it's, it's pessimistic, but, you know, unfortunately, it's also realistic. I mean, we've got the parties that um, not only disagree on policy, but disagree these days on basic facts around, you know, outcomes of elections and everything else. And so um, health care, not surprisingly, is, you know, one of those areas um, where, uh, other than some of the incremental and important incremental areas, um, there's a lot of disagreement about tax policy, about coverage, about the Affordable Care Act, about, you know, Democrats want to, you know, in an ideal world, put everyone in the Medicare program and Republicans want to privatize the whole system. And obviously we're being really simplistic, but healthcare is a big um, sort of fault line, unfortunately, between the parties. But I do think, you know, despite the pessimism, as you said in our talk, I think there's a lot of there are a lot of issues that Republicans and Democrats will probably come together on, uh, even if the process doesn't yield a bipartisan vote. Um, but telehealth is one. Maternal and child health is another. I think public health preparedness, we've all been awoken to the important uh, roles here and the fact that 
as we've learned in the last uh, 13 or 14 months, you can't separate the private health delivery system from the public health system. They're one and the same and integrated. Um, and we've gotten out of this in part because they've worked together and in, in part because of innovation and research. Um, and, and I think at the same time, uh, not to be uh, too much of a pessimist, but also not to have rose colored glasses, I think major, major reforms like the Affordable Care Act for the Democrats and expansions of those are going to be things where you're probably going to see for the next foreseeable future, one party take control and make massive expansions and massive changes. And I think that's we're going to have to deal with that. And I think the goal maybe to bring it back to a, an end for me with a pragmatic place is I think that's really a, a, an important reason why you probably engaged Lauren and I as a Democrat and a Republican. I think it's one of the reasons we need to be substantive and practical and not partisan when we talk to members. We've got to have support on both sides of the aisle for our issues, uh, for the importance of what ASC and its members do every day for patients. And, and those issues like telehealth, like maternal and child health, and some of the other things we've mentioned shouldn't be partisan ideological issues because we're going to have change elections, we're going to have changes of control, and we're going to have to work with both parties to get stuff done. In fact, we have an election coming up in 2022 that probably will change the landscape a bit. Um, in the very brief time that we have, let's, um, can you pick two or three of the, who you think are the key players that we should be paying attention to in terms of what they're interested in, what they may be doing uh, in the new administration? Sure. So to give you my top three, I'll start with the secretary. Um, Sec secretary Javier Becerra, recently confirmed to be the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Um, I've known the secretary, I've had the great honor of knowing him for many years. Um, he hails from California, was most recently Attorney General in the state of California. But before that, he served in the Ways and Means Committee for about 25 years, where I, I got to know him. He has a very personal interest in these issues. When he was a member of Congress, he represented a district in East LA that uh, was one of the poorest districts in the country, where over 200 languages were spoken. So issues around health access and health equity are things he's been working on his entire career. And as Dean noted, health equity is going to be something um, that we see play out, you know, in every um, policy the administration puts forward. But those are issues I think that are, that are personally important to him. He's also married to a physician. Um, so he knows healthcare policy intimately and well, both, both at home and in the workplace. So I think I would expect him to play a very large role in a lot of these issues. Um, in addition to, to the secretary, I'd also highlight uh, my good friend, Chiquita brooks Lashore, uh, who yesterday became the, was confirmed to be the, the administrator for CMS. Uh, Dean and I have both known Chiquita for many years. She's also the first African-American woman to hold that position. She's incredibly formidable. Um, she has spent a number of years working both um, on issues related to coverage and Medicare policy and Medicaid policy. Um, so she she's going to be a force to reckon with, and she definitely has a strong point of view about healthcare policy. But between the two of them, they worked together closely when Chiquita was a staffer on the Ways and Means Committee, and the secretary was a member. So they do have a very strong relationship, and I do think that's something we'll see different in this administration than the previous one, where the secretary and I believe CMS will be very much aligned and what their policy goals will be. I think issues around um, from a consumer perspective, a patient perspective, a Medicare beneficiary perspective is really what's going to drive their policy agenda. Um, and to pick a third person, I'll highlight a woman named Kristen Link Young, who many of you have probably not heard of, um, but she is a, a rock star in the democratic health policy community. She is the president's senior advisor on health policy working at the Domestic Policy Council. She spent a number of years working at the Brookings Institute on issues around affordability and coverage. Um, so between the three of them, I think we're in for quite a ride on, on healthcare policy issues. Great. I'll just add really quickly, and obviously Lauren is um, really close to all these folks. Um, I'll just add one more name and then one general comment. One, I, I think the other person I would add to the list is Andrea Palm. Um, she was a, the health commissioner in the state of Wisconsin, uh, dealt with a lot of COVID issues, uh, worked um, in the, the government as so many of these folks had done before, like Lauren and the Obama administration, worked on Capitol Hill for many years um, and knows the legislative side for uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, and sometimes when, folks like Secretary Becerra get pulled into issues that are that are not necessarily core health issues like border uh, security. They're obviously health 
it related, but you know, people like Andrea are the ones who take over and run the day to day. But but I'll also say generally um, across the board, um, these are folks who are not going to need on the job training. Um, they they in some cases uh, like the Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, they've been in these jobs before, literally. In other cases, they've been in the agencies before, um, and you know, they're people who believe in and want to come back into government. A lot of whom served in previous democratic administrations and 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 who understand policy and so i think it, you know uh, it, it'll be a learning curve and you always sort out the personalities but i, I think it's a very competent um very uh administration that's steeped in healthcare policy and i think the facts um and data um will be important and i think that provides opportunities for us to to talk to those folks beyond just the personal relationships well that's great so we started i was pessimistic but we ended you're making me optimistic. So I think this is a, we, we could go on, I think for another hour, I have so many other topics that we could throw out that we didn't get to, but we'll save them for next year. And uh, I, I wanna thank you. It's really been a, a, a real educational hour. I wanna thank you for joining us uh, in this uh, first part of our healthcare summit at the, at the meeting and uh, look forward to continuing to work with you. Great. Thank you very thank much. You. I'll still hopefully thank next year much. we'll see you in person. Definitely. <laughs> thank you all.